Have you ever wondered why you know the word and have heard of the mythical place of Shangri-La? In today's episode, we're going to the original source. Welcome my mere mortalites to another round of the book reviews. The book reviews for those who want to transcend beyond their own mere mortality. I have something fantastic for you today. It is Lost Horizon by James Hilton. This book was published in 1933 and it's a utopian, although arguably dystopian, fictional adventure of four Westerners who are captured and held against their will in the mythical land of Shangri-La. I don't want to give away too much of the book, but I am going to have to speak a bit about the plot. And so it is about these four Westerners, three British and one American. And even of them, it's only really one of the British guys who matter, who is Glory Conway, Hugh Conway, or as he is mostly referred to in the book as simply Conway. They're meant to be fleeing, evacuating from this place called Baskell when their plane is hijacked and they are kidnapped. And this madman takes them on this epic journey across Asia, essentially deep into the heart of what we think is Tibet. The plane has landed and the pilot mysteriously dies and they're sort of trapped in this area with this looming mountain ahead of them, this absolutely gorgeous landscape but no chance of survival on their own and they are magically found by this traveling little Chinese man called Chang who takes them to his lamasery where it's this amazing, beautiful, constructed I guess temple you would call it, overlooking this little village deep in the heart of the mountains, deep in the middle of nowhere. This place is called Shangri-La and it is fantastic. It has this amazing combination of the old, so these old monastic rituals, old men, these llamas being set in this absolutely wilderness area, crazy, unbelievable place, and then mixing this with the new. So they will have heated baths. They have the ability to communicate in all these different languages. They have a library filled with all these old texts and books and even new stuff. And it has just this amazing combination of seeming like isolation but connection with the world at the same time. Although this place is magical, it does have some downsides. It's not the modern world. It doesn't have easy access to a telegraph. There's no easy access to and from the actual Shangri-La monastery itself. And Chang, the guy who brought them in, is a bit evasive to some of their questions and is not fully enlightening them on the whole situation. The book is told from the perspective of Conway and so the bulk of it is about him, his decisions for wanting to stay, to leave, his looks into the past, what he gained from it. And eventually he's enlightened by the old Lama of the secret of the place. Ooh. And at the end, he is forced to make a decision of whether he's going to stay or whether he is going to go. To end this section, I'm going to touch upon the author and book itself. James Hilton was born in 1900 and was a journalist before converting to becoming a solely book writer and ended up writing quite a few books. From my little bit of research, I think this was particularly interesting that he didn't go to these places himself and he was inspired by other people's words. So he actually didn't travel to these places in Tibet, in Asia, to write this particular book, for example, about Shangri-La. The book itself is about 250 pages long and is noted for becoming one of the very first pocket books, which I guess is what you would call the American version of the Penguin novels, which became very famous for being cheap, easy to make through the printing press that was being established at that time. So this became very, very popular. It was named a battleship, I believe, in the United States and Camp David, where the presidents go for their vacations, was actually called Shangri-La once upon a time. So this book had a huge, huge impact in the... 1940s, 1950s area. We're diving into the themes now. And the first for me was the ideal man, unflappable, stoic, and English. The book does revolve around this character of Conway, Glory Conway. And he's basically someone who's remembered by all. There doesn't seem to be anyone who has a bad thing to say about him. And so there's particular people saying how they met him once, you know, 20, 30 years ago for a very brief experience. And yet he was still captured in their mind. And he just has all these fantastic qualities. He has the qualities of being a leader, but without the desire for power. He is competent. He is strong. He has this magnetic charm about him that draws people in. So what makes him an ideal man, an ideal person, an ideal character? I've created a list of some of the things he exhibited in the book. So for example, he's an onlooker, but he's active. So he'll maintain the situation, have a look when nothing can be done on his part, such as when he's trapped in the plane, he takes it back, he takes it easy. But when there is work to be done, he'll jump into it and get right down to it. 
He's great, but he's damaged by war. So before the war, he had everything going for him. He had good looks, charm, all of these positive aspects, talented at everything. And then he took part in World War I and was shell-shocked essentially, had PTSD. And this actually makes him more likable because you can then see the downsides of his character as well and how he is not a perfect person. He is, as I already said, competent, but he's composed, he's stoic. He's not ruled by the seven sins, the seven deadly sins, but he also feels them as well. So you take some pride in looking at him and he has pride, but not too much. And he is maybe slightly gluttonous with some things in, and he's definitely lazy in some sort of things, but he also you know, doesn't go too deep into them. Moderation, everything in moderation is one of the things the, the llamas in this book talk about and even the moderation in moderation. So he jumps into all of that and then just living in paradox and he's just fun. He's just a person who you look at and you think, man, I could have really good conversations with him. He seems like a genuine cool person. So objectively, is this the ideal man, person, character? Hell no, hell no. I really just liked them. And so this is where you can see some of the things that are personal to me. I really like the quintessential English character. So this is someone like Kossa from Food of the Gods. And you could look at the same person that I have of Conway and think, oh, hell no, he's inactive. He's lazy. He's unambitious. He's shrewd. He doesn't particularly care as much about the other characters as he could have. And so you can think all of these things, maybe even pretentious you could add in and say, nah, you know what? This isn't a great character. But for me, damn, I really enjoyed reading about him and seeing what he was going to do next. One thing that I did connect with this particular point though was how to be ideal. What was it about him that really drew me in? Was it the Englishness of him? Was it the certain characteristics of his personality that I really enjoyed? I don't think so. I think it was more his ability to be calm, to be rational, and to maintain this mindset of what I'm going to even call the Tao. And this could just be because I've been reading a lot of other books about Tao and Taoism recently, but he does have this essential characteristic of being able to be active, but be quiet in his own mind at the same time. He's composed, he's confident in what he's doing, but he's not overly confident as well. It has this moderation aspect to it, which I really think is just what it takes to be almost ideal, to be able to have the capacity to be super active and then super lazy at the same time. The other main theme I grabbed from this book was disillusionment, and this is the loss of the utopic. And this is slightly spoiler alert. So if you want to read the book, go skip this section right now. And there was two main areas where this was seen. The first was of Conway and his disillusionment with Shangri-La. He had this amazing ideal of the place. And then with a couple of well thought out arguments by one of the other characters, it all broke down in front of his eyes. The other then is of the two other characters in the prologue and epilogue discussing Conway and their sort of thoughts of him as a person becoming gradually disillusioned at some point where they can't tell if he's a madman or he's someone who has experienced one of the craziest things that a person could ever experience in their life. I don't normally deconstruct titles, but in this case, I'm going to make an exception because what does Lost Horizon mean? There's no mention of horizons, particularly in the book, let alone Lost Horizons. So what are they trying to get at? What is James Hilton implying with this? I think it's the loss of a youth of greatness and this transition into the old age. So age normally is something that is very bounded, but in this context of being able to live three times, four times even, your your lifespan, you do have this sort of unbounded point. It is still bounded because the main Lama dies, but it does have this feeling of just progressing forward and you are lost in this mythical air of just being able to go throughout at half speed of everything, of not needing to rush anything, of not particularly striving for anything because there's plenty of time for that. You can do all these things later. We can see particularly with Conway how he has this nervous twitch right at the start of the book when he's under pressure having to do all these things. And when he's in Shangri-La, this goes away. He's just in this state of quiet contemplation of feeling, oh, okay, this is the place to be. And then right at the end, when he decides, okay, I am going to actually run away, that's when the nervous twitch returns and you can see it in the book. And it's like, oh, damn. So he has lost something. So I would say Lost Horizon in this case refers to the losing of an idea of the utopia, of this perfect, ideal, utopic land that he's in, and then being transported 
back into the real world, kicking and screaming and all the follies and bad and crap that happens in that area. And so now expanding upon the utopian aspect of that, and I did say disillusionment is the loss of the utopic. So Conway has two losses in this book. The first is his loss of his normal life as he is dragged into the illusion. And that seems to be much more utopic for him. And then there's the loss or the disillusionment of the utopic as he's dragged back out of it into the real world. And for him, I would say the utopia is something very personal, much like how I was saying for me, his character drew me in because of these certain qualities that I really enjoy. The utopia that he found in Shangri-La is definitely particular to him. It does have these combination of the old and the new, of being able to be in quiet serenity of beauty, but then also having the mental stimulus, the challenge of other people, of books, of this sort of forbidden love that he has with one of the other characters as well. And so he gets to experience that utopian aspect of that. To read a quote from page 231, and this is of the two characters in the epilogue discussing Conway. One says, I suppose you consider me a rather credulous person. I really don't think I am. People make mistakes in life through believing too much, but they have a damn dull time if they believe too little. And I think this really caps off this theme. Did Conway make a mistake in being too credulous and believing these monks and believing everything they were saying about old age and how he could have this wonderful existence? Or was it him just wanting to believe too much because he wanted it to be fun? He wanted life to be more exciting. You know, what was the point? Did he make a mistake or did he make the right choice? It's very hard to tell because even at the end of the book, it seems so ambiguous. He really could have gone either way. And I just think that caps off this theme of delusionment and the loss of the utopic. Onto my personal observations and takeaways. And if you haven't garnered it by this point, I bloody love this book. It was really, really good. How do I know that? Well, there was at least two occasions where I delayed my sleep by wanting to read more and more because I came to the end of the chapter and was like, damn it, I can't end here. I need to read at least one more. That particular section where he learned about the monks being ageless was just like, damn it, I need to keep going on and going on. And this was particularly a book for me. So it had all the stuff that I really like. It had monks, it had beautiful scenery in mountains, which is definitely my type of nature. That's my favorite. It had travel, it had war, it had excitement, it had airplanes, it had philosophy, it had this you know, unique, interesting concept of being able to live, but not forever, but to an extended period. And all of this wrapped up into one book just made me go, hell yeah. And there was many aspects of this book that I left untouched as well. I couldn't have time in the book review, such as the, the dark underside, the underbelly of the Lamasari and how they bring people in to maintain their numbers. Is that how unethical is that? It's pretty unethical, but you know, is it maybe ethical because they're providing them with this amazing life that is extended beyond belief? There is the East versus the West. And so the mentality that there is between these Eastern Lamas and the Westerners and their go, go, go mindset versus the calm, relaxed nature. There was also looking about war and how human nature, is it better to be isolated and away from everyone? And would it be good to live in a world where potentially everyone else dies? So many cool things that are stacked in this book that I just was like, holy crap, there's so much in this, so much. So my summary of the book, Lost Horizon, for me, it's in the top 10. This is the best book that I've read in quite a long while. Immersed is not a strong enough word for how deeply I got into this story. The tale ticked off all of my interest boxes and I would say ultimately it was wisdom and philosophy contained in the shell of a really fun story. This is highly subjective as it's not a standout for its style, for its prose, or even for the story itself. It just really communicated to me. And so this is why I'm giving the book Lost Horizon by James Hilton, one of my best reviews ever, a nine out of 10. Fantastic. And so mere mortalites, we've come to the end of another book review and thank you for joining me thus far. I hope I have communicated what Shangri-La is and why you might have heard of this mythical place and of the origination of this story. What are your thoughts on Shangri-La? Would you fit in there? Would you want to live to 200, 300 years old? I would love to know all of these in the comments. If you can do all the cool things, hitting the like button, subscribe, the bell notification, all of that would be fantastic for me and for the channel and I'd really appreciate it. Other than that, I hope you're having a fantastic day wherever you are in the world. Karen out.